Thank you, Julie, for that excellent talk. Lots to think about. I'd like to welcome to the podium at this time uh, Craig Gunderson. He hails from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. He's going to be talking to us about food insecurity in older adults. Okay. Uh, I wanted to uh, begin by thanking all of you for coming to this today. There's lots of other exciting things you could have been doing today, but instead you're here. So I really, really do appreciate it. I also wanted to thank um, the Program Organizing Committee and especially Elaine Waxman, who's on the committee. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to get, you, I've worked with Elaine, I've worked for, for almost probably about five or more, more than five years. She's fantastic. So all of you on the Organizing Committee got to be great, spend some time with her. So that's, that, that, that's great. That's a nice opportunity. Another amazing person is uh, Jim Ziliak. Jim and I have been co-authors now for oh, about over, over 15 years. We continue to do a lot of work together. He's a, just an a dear friend of mine, an amazing guy. So unfortunately, you all get me instead of him. But still, is that, is that, that I'm looking forward to talking with all, with all of you today. So this is the thing that goes. So what I'm going to do today is talk about food security among older adults. So to give you some context on this is last week I was, I was in DC, Economic Research Service at USDA hosted a conference on 50, 50 years, 20 years of measurement of food security, which was amazing to me was how, so I gave a presentation looking back on what's been done and looking forward. What was amazing to me was how little work was discussed at this about food insecurity among seniors. Almost no discussion about this throughout, throughout, the, throughout the meeting. So I'm really happy that, you, that this has been included in this. I, I, I genuinely am. And we, this is an area where we need more research. We need a lot more research on this, on this topic, needless to say. Okay, so now let me start, let me begin. That was my beginning. So I want to talk about the definitions of the category of food insecurity. So this is, when I, throughout my presentation today, this is what I'm going to mean when I say food insecurity. There's 18 questions on the core food security module, the CFSM. These are examples of questions. Like the most mild, this is for, for, uh, for households with only adults is, there's 10 questions for households with adults and children, there's 18. I'm going to be describing four of the questions that are used on the adult module, but later I'm going to talk about there's a more and more multi-generational families, and so a lot of the, the, the families are getting all 18 questions. But here's examples of questions. First one, getting that worry. The most severe one is in the last 12 months that you or other adults in your household never ate for a full day because there wasn't enough money for food. All these questions are based upon economic constraints that people face. This, in my opinion, has become the leading health-related nutrition issue in the United States today. People talk about obesity, obesity, obesity. Let's talk about food insecurity. Food insecurity is where so much of the action is in terms of negative health outcomes, and I think we need to talk about this more for seniors, but also for the general population. But today I'm here to talk about this in the context of seniors. Okay, so definitions of the food insecurity category that I'm gonna be talking about today is I'm gonna be talking about marginally food insecure, which is also known as a threat of hunger, and that means that there's one or more affirmative answers to the thing. Marginal food security is not often used as a category, marginal food insecurity is not often used as a category, but for reasons I can go into later if we want to, it should be used more than it is. The second category is food insecure, or as we oftentimes refer to as at risk of hunger, and this is three or more affirmative responses to the core food security much. This is what they mean in the, in the US. So for example, they recently, every September they release the extent of food insecurity in the United States is it's based on the second measure, food insecurity, that we also call at risk of hunger. And the other one is very low food secure, which is also, also sometimes called facing hunger. So this is what we mean when we talk about food insecurity in the United States. So this is, so Jim and I have done work for, we uh, did a, a thing for the Air. P Foundation, we've done work for Merck Foundation. The work that I'm gonna be talking about today is work that we do um, with the wonderful people at the National Foundation to End Senior Hunger, Nefesh. So I'm gonna be talking about the results we use for this. All of what I'm gonna be talking about generally is concentrated on those who are 60 years of age and, um, and older. So that's what I'm gonna be talking, talking about this. So looking at this figure then, this first one here, is this looks at the trends and the threat of senior hunger. In other words, this is also known as um, is, is marginal food insecurity. Couple, two, two main things to note is that we saw that, like with the rest of the population, is there was a sharp increase in, in uh, food insecurity rates during the, after the Great Recession. Like for the rest of the population, despite the end of the Great Recession, about here, food insecurity rates have remained very high among seniors. 
One other thing I want to point out about this is that if you see here is that seniors saw an increase in their food insecurity rates before the Great Recession began. So something was going on there that was important to note. The third thing I want to talk about on this is this here is the number of, oh, I guess, I guess let's three, is the number of food insecure seniors. It rose from about 5 million seniors in 2001 up to almost 10 million by 2013. In other words, there's almost a, basically a doubling of the number of food insecure seniors in us. We don't hear that mentioned nearly enough. This is a problem that this doubled, okay? It's in part because we have more seniors in the United States, as some of the other presentations mentioned earlier, but it's also because food insecurity rates have been rising over this time period. I don't know why more people aren't up in arms over this, because it really is a serious, serious problem. Okay, now this, for those of you, some of you are from these states, I think. Oh, <laughs> DC. So anyway, so these are so these are the top ten states in terms of the threat of food of senior hunger in 2013. So what you'll see is, and, and, and most of these are not really actually none of them are that much of a surprise. So this is what you'll see then is, and so there's a lot of variation across the United States. So for example, North Dakota has the lowest rates in the United States, and I think they're like around like two or three percent. All states have some level of food insecurity among seniors, but these are the top 10 states in terms of the threat of senior hunger. Okay, now, as with the general population, is there's a lot of variation by, in terms of the probability of being food insecure. So what you'll see here is those who are at the lowest level of income, i.e. less than 50% of the poverty line, they have the levels of food insecurity rates. Those who are above 20% of the poverty line, these are the food, uh, the, the food insecurity rates amongst, amongst those group. Okay, so this is as we would expect, right? Now, this is also something that's worth emphasizing that people always think poverty means food insecurity. That's not the case. Over half of food insecure people in the United States, over half of poor people in the United States are food secure. There's millions of, they're suffering from other problems potentially, but they're able to maintain their food security status. Look at this figure here. What you see then is for those who are suffering from, who are marginally food insecure, what you'll see is almost 30% have incomes above 20% of the poverty line, okay? Food insecurity occurs across, yes, it's more common amongst those who are lower income, but it occurs across the, um, across the uh, income spectrum. And so we have to be cognizant of that when we're designing policies. Hunger rates, again, is it's higher amongst African Americans than amongst whites. But again, the face of hunger in the United States amongst seniors is, is predominantly white, okay? So we have these differences. So it depends upon the questions that we're posing that we have to think about some of these, some of these issues. Okay, now, this is um, the trends in the threat of food insecurity by age. Oftentimes people perceive food insecurity as being a problem amongst those who are very old. And that's a lot of the, you know, the, the, what people, the face of, is, of senior hunger. But the reality though is, as can be seen by this figure, is those who are younger seniors are more likely to be food insecure than older seniors. So we have to figure out ways to reach those we have to figure out ways, of course, to reach those who are over the age of 80. We also have to figure out those ways to reach those who are, who are at younger ages. Okay, so what do we know from multivariate regression models? These are some of the things. I won't read these off, but there's two things I want to point out about this. First, I already talked about being younger. This aspect about food insecure seniors being younger holds even after we control for other factors. This, the second to last one I have, I have there is having a grandchild in the household, okay? Seniors, so we, uh, Jim Ziliak and I have done quite a bit of work on um, looking at um, food insecurity amongst um, multi-generational households. In fact, we have a paper that's coming out in Southern Economic Journal, which discusses this, uh, there's actually a special issue on food insecurity that Jim and I co-edited. Co anyway, but one of the papers is looking at this. So is that, Ha people talk about the problems. Uh, um, so having a grandchild in the house is a major predictor of food insecurity among seniors. What's interesting though, I think it's interesting, maybe nobody else will, children in households with a grandparent present, all else equal, are less likely to be food insecure. So in thinking about these multi-generational households is households with seniors, the seniors are worse off than they otherwise would be. The grandchildren are better off than they're. That pr produces some policy 
some key policy implications I think we have to talk about. Um, so as we talk about uh, multi-generational households, this is something that I think we need to be talking about. Okay, speaking fast, so I got 10, 10 minutes and 20 seconds. So this is, okay, so that's still on time for that. Okay, so now I wanna talk about healthcare, okay? I think that food insecurity is a moral issue in the United States. I think there's something wrong. I mean, I love the United States, but I think there's something wrong that we have so many people who are food insecure, especially, I mean, especially we can say especially children, especially seniors, whatever. This, it's, it's wrong. We had to solve food insecurity, even if there was no health, negative health outcomes associated with this. But we know that there's profound negative health outcomes associated with food insecurity. And what this figure shows us then is some regression adjusted estimates of the effect of food insecurity on various various um, um, health outcomes for seniors months. So clear the cause here, the causality is pretty clear is that being food insecure leads to reduced nutrient intakes across the board. This morning, we heard a lot about reduced nutrient reductions in nutrient intakes among seniors and some of the problems that they pose. One thing we need to be talking about is why are they lower? Well, one of the reasons is people can't afford enough food. And this is what we'll see here. Across the board, seniors have lower intakes of these essential nutrients because they're food insecure. Okay, so I think we need to, in any discussions about limited uh, nutrient intakes among seniors, let's be talking about all of this. Okay. This then shows something similar is the effect of food insecurity on health outcomes of seniors over 60. So some of the things I want to point out is depression rates are extraordinarily high even after controlling for other factors among seniors who are food insecure. Um, their probability of being in excellent or very good health is substantially less if somebody is food insecure. Across the board, we have all these problems. Now, here, I am not making a causal claim is that some of these things will cause this. I mean, nutrient, I think the, ca the causality is clear. It's hard, it's hard well, maybe some of you could figure out ways, but I can't, how to go the other way. But in this context, it's, the causality is not as clear, but we do see evidence that at least food insecurity is associated with them. We need more work on figuring out these causal issues. Now, the profound effect of this on food insecurity and ADL, take this ADL, see it's not helpful, because you can't, so when you use this thing, it's always hard because you're looking here, but you can't see what you're seeing, well, you can see it here, but you're not pointing at it. So that's the complicated thing. But I think that ADL limitations is right there. So ADL limitations is, it's equivalent, being food insecure is equivalent in these multivariate regressions to being 14 years older. That's the effect of food insecurity in this context. It's a profound, profound effect. So let's be talking more about food insecurity. Well, I am. So, okay, so what can we do? What can we do? Snap, snap, hey, you know, most, uh, I should say most, some government programs, it depends on what city I'm taught, speaking in. When I was in Texas, I said most, but here I'll say some. I guess if in New York City, I have to say all government programs work. But anyway, in, in, in Washington, D.C., I'll say some government programs work, okay? So let's just say that some don't. SNAP works. It, when people say, what's an example of a successful government program? We say SNAP, SNAP. SNAP is an amazing, amazing program. I don't know why more people say, boy, what an amazing program. Maybe people do. But anyway, people should be saying that more. So I want to talk about SNAP in this context. Primary goal is to alleviate hunger in the United States. Study after study after study, not using, uh, study after study has shown that food insecurity rates are less among SNAP participants in comparison to eligible non-participants, okay? How many programs can say that? We set out to do something, we did it. Ha, that's pretty amazing, okay? That's what SNAP does. It's the far and away the largest food assistance in the program in the United States, based by benefit levels, by size of program, and critically, so many of the USDA's assistance programs are only for, say, for children, okay? School lunch programs, school meal programs. Look, SNAP is available across the entire age spectrum. It's an amazing program. Here's the eligibility criteria, and the eligibility criteria is lower for seniors than it is. So for example, the gross income test is not binding. Um, the net income test is oftentimes easier for seniors for various reasons. And then the asset test is often waived. But it's at a lower level anyway for seniors. So, SNAP, what can we do? That gives you some background on SNAP. I don't want to spend too much time on this. The first thing is to encourage participation. Now, of course, we have to encourage, and most of our work has been done looking at the, the over 60 group. We have to encourage participation rates amongst those group. But in some earlier work uh, that Jim and I did is, we found that the participation rates among seniors were actually lowest controlling for relevant factors, including volatility of income, including assets and everything, between those who are 40 and 60. Now, 
I wanted to thank AARP Foundation for your support of this, um, of this conference. And for AARP Foundation is I also wanted to say, I know that uh, in our work for them is we concentrated on those 50 and older. In fact, I just saw this today, you know, in, in that packet, there's a, a, a paper I did the empirical work for. I didn't, even, I didn't even have seen that before. And so, but it's good to see it. It's good to see that, that was out there. That's good, that's great. I, maybe I did see it, but I don't know. But anyway, there, there's a whole thing about hunger in America, say this funds by, 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 by ARP Foundation. Anyway. Yes, people talk about encouraging participation amongst the old over 60. Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's figure out, though, why there's this group, especially these people are between 40 and 60, who no longer have children in the household, perhaps, who have quite a bit lower rates of, of, of staff participation. This is especially important because we know the staff leads to reductions in food insecurity. Any discussion about food insecurity has to, has to involve SNAP. We can't talk about reducing food insecurity without talking about SNAP, okay? Now, this is one thing that we've seen, again, is this multi-generational families face a lot of challenges. One problem is, is that it may be that a grandparent is caring for a grandchildren, say, for a large part of the month, but technically they're not necessarily the primary caregivers. So therefore, they can't get the SNAP benefits. So they, if they are getting SNAP, they're not getting quite as much as they, as they would otherwise. So let's figure out how we can, we can address those issues, both in terms of the benefit levels, but also in terms of entering a program. It's, all caters paribus, it's easier to get into program if you have more people in the household, so we have to think about that. Okay, um, you know, I'm a, since I love SNAP, as I always say, let's raise benefit levels, and that would be my preference, just across the board. But I know that that's not what we can always do. But if we do have to think about it is, I think those with the lower levels of getting lower levels of SNAP, I think that's a group where it would be nice to increase those levels and figure out whether Pay for that. So anyway, so let's reevaluate the minimum levels that for that. Um, so one other thing that I, I want to point out about SNAP, and for those of you who, who have heard me speak in other contexts, well, most of you probably never heard me speak before anyway. But anyway, is one thing that I always say is these these restrictions. You you, you, hear, you hear these. Uh, well, I usually call them crazy, but I won't call them that. But anyway, the people are thinking about imposing restrictions on what people can purchase with SNAP benefits. You've heard all that. Uh, those people saying that. That's a bad idea in general because it stigmatizes, but it's especially bad for older adults. Can you imagine when people say we should restrict what people can purchase with SNAP? Can you imagine saying to a 70-year-old grandmother wanting to buy some Gatorade for her kids when they come home for the weekend and that she'd like to use SNAP benefits, saying to her, we know better than you do what you should, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be purchasing for your grandchildren, okay? So for those of you with any say on this is always be against SNAP restrictions but especially being in SNAP restrictions because it patronizes older, older Americans. Okay, the next thing is, is to reach out to the socially isolated. When Jim and I do our work, is, it comes up again and again. Those who are socially isolated are much more likely to be food insecure. I don't know, this is like, so oftentimes we search to the government for answers to this. I have no idea about how the government can do anything about this, but maybe, there's other, there's other entities besides the government, of course. We can do something about this, but I think this is really critical. How do we reach out to those who are socially isolated? And this is a, something I come back to again and again and again. Along with not having nearly enough research on seniors is we don't have nearly enough uh, research on persons with disabilities, okay? A lot of seniors have challenges with disabilities. And in particular, a lot of seniors have challenges with mobility issues, okay? How can we help them out? What can be done about this? These are non-government solutions, but also maybe they need higher levels of SNAP benefits. I don't know what it is. But in thinking about this is, I think this is critical, is figuring out why, you know, how, how can we help out those with mobility issues? And it goes without saying is that we have to recognize the informal food assistance programs, whether it be the food assistance program, informal food assistance programs through Feeding America, and their network of, of food banks, or whether it be through Meals on Wheels, we have, to think, we have to acknowledge the importance of this. It's especially important for those at the, marge, at the margin. In other words, they just need a little bit more money, okay? SNAP benefits have run out, they're important, this is important for them, but it's also important for those who are um, ineligible for SNAP, okay? Oh, see, back in the olden days, remember when you had the overhead projectors? You could always see what you're gonna say next because it would come up. You go, oh, oh, that's what I'm gonna talk about. But here, you don't always see it. You, don't, you get surprised, oh yeah, that was, so I, sometimes I will say things and then it comes up after I say it. But you, you, you all have that same experience, I'm sure. Okay, so now what are, they asked me to talk about future research directions. First one is, why is there a negative age gradient? I have 50, okay, I'm putting these all up here in case I 
don't get, no, oh, that's not good. So I have four things, but I have 45 seconds left. Why is there a negative age gradient? You know, why we'd expect that it would be older seniors should probably more likely be 40 years. That's not the case. What is going on there? This, there's a higher and higher proportion of our society in multi-generational households. It skyrocketed during the Great Recession, and those levels have not come back down. They're still very high. How, how does multi-generational households influence food insecurity? How does it influence it for the seniors? How, that's a topic here, but also how does it influence it for, for, for the grandchildren? Um, and the other thing is how do chronic health conditions influence food insecurity and vice versa? We have, there has been enough work on some of these causal issues and how might allowing home delivered meals to be purchased with SNAP influence? So, four, three, two, one. So, okay. <laughs>